So what brought me to the University of Idaho in 2002? The exact same thing that brought me here today. What is that reason? That reason is that one book can change our lives. And I don't mean that one book can change our lives in the way that we teachers or your parents may say books are good for you, kind of like carrots are good for you. Instead, what I mean is books can change your life. They can change where you live, what you believe, and what you do for work, all by cracking open one single book. And how do I know this? Because one book, this book right here, Desert Solitaire by Edward Abbey, changed my life. Edward Abbey was an anarchist, an environmentalist, and an environmental writer. And he was one of the most important environmental writers in American history. He's up there with Henry David Thoreau, John Muir, and Rachel Carson. He wrote 21 books, and he was born in 1927 in Home, Pennsylvania, and he died 62 years later in Tucson, Arizona. He knew he was dying because he had esophageal varices, otherwise known as internal bleeding. And he told his friends and his family that when he died, he did not want to be buried in a cemetery. Instead, he wanted his body to be taken out and buried in wilderness. So on the day before he died, one of Abby's very best friends, Doug Peacock, leaned in close to Abby and whispered where they planned on burying him. And Abby, sick and without energy, couldn't do much more than smile. And then the next day, when Abby finally passed away, Peacock and three other friends put Abby's body in the back of a pickup truck, and they drove out to some great, wild, unknown desert. And there, they spent two days digging or searching for a location to bury Abby. And when they finally found a location, they laid his body in the grave, covered it up, and set on top of it a hand-carved basalt rock that just said Edward Abbey, 1927 and 1989. And then there was two words on it, no comment. <laughs> and this gravesite was known to Abbey's closest friends and his family and those turkey vultures banking overhead. But to the rest of us, this gravesite is one of the great mysteries of the American West. In 1994, I was a senior at Western State College in Gunnison, Colorado. And I was a business major. And the reason I was a business major is because my parents were business people. My brother was a business person. And because my school told me that they wouldn't graduate me unless I had a major. So I chose business. What was I going to do with it? I had no idea. I was completely lost back then. And then one day, my best friend House came over to my apartment, and he brought a book with him. And he said, Sean, read this book. I think you'll love it. And this book was Desert Solitaire. So I took it out into my backyard on a beautiful sunny day like we have today here, and I started reading it. And I couldn't put it down. And instead, I should have been studying for my accounting final. I had a C in that class, and I just barely passed it in the end. But instead, I read Desert Solitaire. And the reason I read it was because Abby wrote about the desert southwest, this landscape right here, in ways that I'd never experienced before in a book. I saw the landscape when I read his words. I could feel the sun burning down on me. I could feel my lips getting cracked just by how he wrote it. I could see the slot canyons. But he didn't just write great descriptions. He also talked about how we had to preserve our lands, how we had to protect our public lands, how we had to make sure we didn't abuse them. But then he didn't want us to just do that. He didn't want us to just think about our lands. He wanted us to go explore them. He wanted us to get out of our houses and into our cars and travel to those lands. But then once we got there, he told us, in the first place, you can't see anything from a car. You've got to get out of the goddamn contraption and walk. <laughs> Better yet, crawl. Now you see why I love Abby. On hands and knees, over the sandstone and through the thorn bush and cactus, when traces of blood begin to mark your trail, you'll begin to see something. Maybe. Probably not. And when I finished Desert Solitaire, I kind of mourned it. It was my favorite book of all times. So what did I do? I did the exact same thing that so many of us do when we finish a book we loved. I started reading another book by Edward Abbey, and then another and another. I read The Monkey Wrench Gang, then Hey Duke Lives, then Fool's Progress, then Black Sun. I read them all, almost all 20 of Abbey books. And then I started reading other authors by Desert Southwest writers. I read Terry Tempest Williams and her beautiful mem memoir, Refuge. I read Charles Bowden, Blue Desert. I read Doug Peacock, and Jack Loeffler, and David Peterson. And these books moved me, and I love them. And I accidentally became a scholar 
of desert Southwest literature, something I never expected to be. And that's the great thing about becoming so curious about any one thing like desert solitaire. It literally makes you smarter. We're not born with a, sp a specific amount of curiosity nor of intelligence. Instead, we can grow or shrink either one of those just by being curious. There's a great research study done by Sophie von Stumm, and she did a meta-study where she looked at 200 different educational studies with 50,000 students. And what she was looking for is what are the best predictors for future academic success? And what she discovered is that it's not intelligence, which is what I would have expected it to be. Instead, it's curiosity. The most curious students are those that have the most academic success. And to go along with that, more curious people score 12 points higher than less curious people on IQ tests. So just by reading Desert Solitaire and all these other books, I couldn't help but learn and grow. Another way I was growing from reading Desert Solitaire was once I graduated, I had to get a job. I had no idea what to do. I had my business degree in my hand, but I couldn't figure out what to do. So I did the only logical thing. I joined the Peace Corps. So I traveled down to Jamaica, and they assigned me to the Jamaica Chamber of Commerce, where I gave out micro loans to inner city residents. And this was great work, important work, beautiful work. But my heart was slowly moving toward the environmental field. So what I did is I got a second assignment to work for Blue and John Crow Mountains National Park. And there I helped them become self-sustainable. And then once I returned back to America, I moved to the Pacific Northwest and worked for the Northwest Youth Corps, and then to the Desert Southwest to work for Southwest Conservation Corps. And here I spent days and weeks and months living in a tent. When it rained, we would get wet. When it snowed, we would be cold. And my crew of 10 trail builders would go out and we'd build trails, maintain trails, build wilderness bridges all around the Pacific Northwest and Desert Southwest. And as I was doing all this, as I was working with my crews of at-risk youth, what I realized is my business degree taught me how to sell ideas. Sell, or sorry, taught me how to sell goods and services. But I didn't have any goods and services to sell. But what I did have was ideas, environmental ideas now, and then later creative writing ideas. And when I had these ideas to sell, they literally made me feel like I had a purpose, a reason. And that made me happy. And it makes me happy today when I sell these ideas. But that's not just me saying this. The Gallup organization did a survey of 130,000 people all across the globe, and what they were looking for is what makes a person happy. So what they did is they first looked for who are the most happy people in this survey, and then what traits do they all share? And one of the two most important traits is curiosity. So just by reading a book, and just by following my passion from that book, I was leading a curious life and therefore a happy life. And then the final thing I want to talk about today is when I finished Desert Solitaire, what I felt was that Abby had written it for someone just like me. And because he wrote it for someone just like me, I felt as if maybe I too could write like Abby. So Abby and Desert Solitaire were the reasons I picked up a pen and started writing. And I tried to write as beautifully as Desert Solitaire, and I failed completely. But still, reading Desert Solitaire was a genesis moment for me. It started my writing career. And then eight years after reading Desert Solitaire, I ended up here at the University of Idaho in the Master of Fine Arts program for creative nonfiction. And then once I graduated, I needed to write a book. That's what happens. So I searched and searched and searched for what to write about, and I had no idea I was lost, just like I was lost when I was a business major trying to figure out what the heck to do. And then it finally dawned on me. What I needed to write about was what I was most curious about, Edward Abbey and his hidden desert grave. So that's what I did. I wrote a book, Finding Abbey, The Search for Edward Abbey and His Hidden Desert Grave. And this book took me about five years to write. And it's part biography of who Abbey is. It's part travelogue as I travel around the country searching for the spirit of Abbey. And then it's part memoir as I ask Abbey, now dead, a ghost mentor for me, how to live my life and where to live my life. I was living in a city far from the mountains, and I was feeling placeless. So I was using Abby as a way to figure out what to do. So I got in my pickup truck any chance I got, and I drove to home Pennsylvania where Abby was born. I went to Hoboken, New Jersey, where Abby lived, and where he struggled in the city, just like I was struggling in the city. 
And then I went to Moab, Utah, and Santa Fe, and Albuquerque, and Durango, and finally I ended up in Tucson, Arizona. And along the way, I interviewed some of Abby's best friends, Doug Peacock, Jack Loeffler, Ken Slight, and David Peterson, those very same people that I had read years before. But I didn't just interview them over the phone or just sit across a table. Instead, David Peterson took me to a bar and we drank margaritas and he got misty-eyed as he talked about Abbey's spirit being everywhere in the West. And he called that land Abbey country. And Ken Slight talked to me in his house in the LaSalle Mountains of Utah about the, the damming of Glen Canyon and the creation of Lake Powell. He called it Lake Fowl. And Jack Loeffler brought me into his office, and he climbed up to the top of his bookshelf, and he brought down this box, and he opened up the box, and in it was a stack of typed papers. And it was the first copy of the Monkey Wrench Gang, and he put it in my hands, and I could feel the weight of the book, the metaphorical weight of one of the most important radical environmental texts ever written. And then Doug Peacock took me out into the desert with a six-pack of beer, a bottle of wine, and two camp chairs. And we sat in the shade of his pickup truck, and he talked about Abby's dying day, and then Abby's burial. And once I had accumulated all these stories, once I learned everything I could, then it was time to me, for me to go search for Abby's grave. So that's what I did. My best friend, Hal, still my best friend after all these years, joined me in the desert, and we spent two nights sleeping underneath a black blanket of stars, and we spent two days searching and failing and searching and failing, the sun burning down on us, our ears turning red, our noses red, our lips chapped. We stumbled into cactuses and blood was running down our ankles. We searched and we failed. And we were down to the last few hours until House had to get on a plane and return to his work and his family. And it was only in those last moments when we found something. And whatever we found and wherever we found it, it was so powerful that it changed my life. I returned to my city where I worked, and I put my house on the market and sold it three weeks later. I resigned my position. I moved to northern Vermont, where I met my beautiful wife, Sarah, and I started all over, all because of reading one single book. And what I ask you now is what book or idea or person or adventure will change your life? My book is Desert Solitaire. And 22 years ago, my best friend House came over to my apartment and he gave me a book. And he said, read this book, you'll love it. He should have said, read this book, it will change your life. So what one book will change your life? What one book will change where you work, what you believe, or where you live? I can't wait to hear from you what that book is and what adventures it takes you on. Thank you so much.